Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Alex Hu. I'm the chairman of the Ontario Regional Group of Vice Chair and a Vice President at Staunton Tamatati. But of course, today I'm on behalf of our Ontario Regional Group, obviously. Our regional group usually hosts uh, technical seminars at least two or three times a year. So the group members, local structure engineers and engineering students can take these chances to gather together in person, enjoy the events as well as networking. Unfortunately, due to this pandemic thing, we have canceled all the in-person events this year and have decided to change all the events online going forward. And this is our first online event this year. I'm not sure um, how many people, let's see, what is 100, about 150 people show up at this moment. But uh, what surprised me was we have over 600 people from over 40 countries registered in this event by this noon, which is definitely phenomenal. Our original, I mean, original intent of this event is for local engineers and students, obviously. Now it becomes an uh, international one. So that's really the power of the internet. We're very, very glad to see this and very exciting about that. Anyways, as with the previous procedure of our uh, regional group event, the regional group chair, sometimes other committee members will take this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, ISROC -E, our regional group, and sometimes you know, something you should know about our professing structural engineering of course. So tonight should be no difference. And I'm very happy to do this, especially for those uh, university students who are pre you know, preparing to indulge in the profession of structural engineering. I know many of you might already can't wait to enjoy the presentation, so, so do I. So I'm gonna try my best to run my slides as fast as possible, okay? Okay, next please. Um, the first thing you should know about uh, is the designation of structural engineer. Not everyone can call themselves structural engineers. I mean, in order to be a structural engineer, different countries have different uh, criteria. But in general, you have to meet some stringent academic requirements and uh, engineering experience requirements, plus additional technical examinations as required. Once you met all the requirements and pass all the required examinations, then you are qualified to be a structural engineer. So it's not the easy thing. It's definitely not the easy thing. And we must be proud of ourselves and our profession. Next, please. Um, and the iStructure, e, the institution of structural engineers, is the world's largest professional body dedicated to structural engineering. And we have led the structural engineering profession worldwide for over 100 years. The chart of the membership of ISROG represents the highest category in terms of the structural engineering excellence. And is considered as the international passport to the practice of structural engineering. Next, please. Um, other than chartered membership, um, the Institution provides various level membership. Next, please. Uh, from the free, uh, free student membership to the most advanced level fellow. So within iStructure E, you will not only be, be able to enjoy all the resources of learning, but also you have the opportunities to advance yourself as well as to network with different level of members to improve your employability. This is very important for young engineers, and, uh, new graduate students. Okay, next please. So we currently have over 27,000 members from 105 countries. And council members were elect elected from 33 regional group around the world. Although the institution is headquartered in UK, but there are actually more international members than UK members. So in this sense, iStructure has already been a global institution for a global profession. Next, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, in Americas, we have over 800 members totally. Obviously, it's not too big. In which there are around 300 members in Canada and 300 members in the US. 
we have about 100 members here in our Ontario regional group, which is the second largest regional group in Canada. The largest one was in BC. So obviously, uh, comparing to the big amount of the total members globally, we have a huge potential of growth in members in our region in the future. Therefore, I would like to take this chance to strong, uh, I strongly encourage those um, who attend this event today but have not been applying any members yet to consider to join our institution. And I believe this is going to be one of your best decisions that you made on behalf of your, you know, to benefit your profession, professional career in structural engineering. I mean, especially to those uh, new graduate engineering students. Okay, next. Okay, so now it's the, it's the show time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends, tonight on behalf of the, of the Ontario Regional Group, I'm extremely excited to have my colleague Bob, Mr. Robert Singh, to talk about the engineering Jeddah Tower. Bob is currently a principal in TT Chicago office and is the former wide director of structure engineering design for new building structures. He has over 35 years of combined experience at SOM and TT, and he has been involved in the structural design of several world renowned large complex building projects, including the famous Bilbao's Guggenheim Museum in Spain and uh, the Trump International Hotel and Tower in Chicago. Bob is a fellow of the ACI, American Concrete Institute, a fellow of the ASC, American Society of Civil Engineers, and a fellow of the IABSE, International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineering. Bob received his BSc degree from Northwest University, Chicago, 1982, and his MSc degree from MIT in 1984. His current work, his current work includes the direction of uh, structural design on the one kilometer tall Jeddah Tower, currently under construction in Saudi Arabia, which is exactly the project that he's going to talk about today. So before I pass the control to Bob, one more last thing I'd like to remind is if you have any question during the presentation, please feel free to click the Q&A button, the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Bob will answer your questions in the Q&A session after his presentation. Okay, Bob, it's your time now. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure here to be invited uh, by the Ontario uh, chapter of iStruct-D to uh, talk about uh, the Jeddah Tower. And uh, perhaps just to get uh, started, uh, a few facts uh, to get everybody oriented. Thornton Tomasetti were the structural engineers for the tower. The architect was Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill Architecture, uh, based in Chicago. Uh, we won the competition in, in June of 2009, and we finished the, the final design documents in 2013. The project is under construction, and there's been a series of design uh, revisions as we, as we went along, and even some as we went into construction. The design, uh, it's a concrete building, and the design is to ACI 318, even though it's in Saudi Arabia. ACI 318 is uh, recognized as really the gold standard for reinforced concrete design around the world. The uh, general contractor for the construction is uh, a Saudi bin Laden group, local, local firm. Here's a sort of a brief lineup uh, to get you some idea of the height of the tower. Uh, two other uh, Thornton Tomasetti projects, Taipei 101 and Shanghai, uh, Shanghai Tower, both uh, completed. Shanghai Tower just recently, over 600 meters in height. Burj Khalifa, as I'm sure you all know, is 830-odd meters. Uh, Jeddah Tower, uh, upon completion, would be uh, 1,000 meters, one kilometer plus. It would be not only the world's tallest building, but the first man-made structure to reach one kilometer in height. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know your geometry or your geography very well, uh, Jeddah is uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's on the uh, far west coast on the Red Sea. And Jeddah is the uh, sort of the gateway 
for the pilgrims who come to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Uh, and they usually pass through Jeddah because that's the international uh, airport that's closest to those two uh, holy cities. So when they when the uh, pilgrims for Hajj uh, come to Saudi Arabia, they go through Jeddah. So it's a very important city in, in the kingdom. The picture on the left is uh, of Prince Al-Walid. Uh, he's, um, you probably have seen him many times on CNN and other news stations. Uh, he's an investor, a uh, very active one. And in, in Saudi Arabia, they call him the Warren Buffett of, of, of the kingdom, but he is the brainchild. Of, of this particular project. The drawings that you see in front of him are the Thornton Tomasetti Foundation plans uh, for the tower, but that was during the, the earliest pile, pile foundation construction phase. Uh, the tower is going to be the centerpiece of a very large master plan development right on the Red Sea, just north of the uh, airport in Jeddah. So it's in a, in a currently undeveloped uh, piece of land although the, uh, the area right adjacent to the Red Sea has a series of villas and so forth. But uh, Kingdom City uh, is basically going to be planned around the tower. The, the idea is the tower would be built and several other uh, buildings, particularly residential uh, housing for uh, folks, will be uh, very nearby the tower. Now, the tower is uh, a mixed use, but it's primarily a residential tower. So starting from the bottom, there's a few office floors where the tower uh, floor plates are relatively large. Uh, then there's uh, a small hotel, five-star hotel. Uh, uh, basically, there's some ser service departments uh, and then a series of residential units, con condominiums, which take up the bulk of the tower uh, stacking. And then there are uh, so-called executive suites that can be used for both residential or also for, for small office spaces for very special uh, people, as you can imagine. And then the, the penthouse at the very uh, top of the tower, which will likely be the uh, location for Prince uh, uh, Walid's <laughs> uh, units and so forth. Now, um, if you uh, take away one slide from the entire presentation tonight, this is probably the most important one, honestly, because it, it talks about how the structural system is organized. Uh, you see here sort of an axometric. Uh, everything in the, uh, the system is vertical, all the walls that you see, except for the dark blue. The dark blue actually inclines. You saw that the tower is, is a tapered uh, uh, form. But the blue uh, elements of the walls are the only thing that really uh, incline. Everything else is vertical. All the aqua shape that you see there, the walls are vertical. So there's, there's no columns in the system, only, only, only walls. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a system that was meant to be as simple to build and as straightforward as possible. Uh, there are no planted walls or, or transferred walls where a wall sits on a uh, transfer girder, nothing like that. Basically, the walls are start at the bottom and continue up until the blue walls actually uh, become too close to the uh, aqua walls, and then the aqua wall simply drops off. So there's no transfer whatsoever. All the floors are uh, flat plate construction, conventionally reinforced. Typical residential floors are 250 mm thickness. So again, as simple as you can get, no. Uh, perimeter spandrel beam whatsoever. Uh, it, the system is basically all walls. All the stories are four meters in height. And that was done very specifically so that the formwork wasn't constantly changing with the usage of, of different types of usage and so forth. And it also gave a very generous story height for the residential units, which would normally be closer to three or 3.2 meters in story height, which is what is in the Burj Khalifa. Uh, all the walls are connected by coupling beams. So there's no, you know, a lot of the super tall buildings that you see basically have a core and an exterior, a few columns, probably very large columns, and then they're connected by outriggers. That's not what we have in the system whatsoever. There are no outriggers in the system whatsoever. And all the walls are connected by coupling beams. And why that's so important 
is when you have to talk about the vertical shortening of the tower under the weight of the building and the uh, inelastic effects due to concrete creep and shrinkage. It's extremely important that everything is connected. So everything is moving downward in, this, in roughly the same way because the walls can then basically redistribute loads through the coupling beams and equalize the stresses in the walls. So it's a very, it seems very simple to look at, but it took us a while to actually get to the point where, that you see there on the slide. Now that here's some history for you. And, I, and uh, trust me, I, I, I've shown this slide in Seattle, in Chicago, in Dubai, and in Shanghai. It's not just because I'm talking to folks from Toronto this evening, but uh, it's a, the system is a bearing wall system. So you see Kingdom Tower, now called Jeddak Tower on the far right. You see a Burj Khalifa and CN Tower from Toronto, uh, side by side at the base and what they look like. And you see some similarities, of course, between Jeddah Tower and, and Burj Khalifa. It's the same architect for both of them. And, and uh, Jeddah came on the heels of, of Burj Khalifa and it's a very successful system. But there's some very difference in between Jeddah Tower and Burj Khalifa. Uh, but the thing that uh, I would go back is all, all the way to 1970, more or less, and look at the system for CN Tower. It's, it's also a three-legged building. It's a tapered building. Uh, the Burj Khalifa is a stepped tower. It actually has setbacks and, uh, and outriggers and so forth. But CN Tower is, it's not a building, of course. It's, a, it's an observation uh, and communication tower. But you see the walls are, are basically divided up into uh, quadrants or, or sections the cells, you might say. You also see that the walls at the very edges of the three wings on CN Tower are very thick. You can see sort of the black there, two meters thick at the edges of, of CN Tower. And when I was working on Jetta Tower, I always look back at CN as sort of an inspiration on what uh, a, a beautiful system for such a, a tall, slender tower would be. And I think it's, it's probably a better comparison to Jeddah Tower than, than even for Burj Khalifa. Now in terms of the architectural planning, here's how the building uh, functions. Uh, there are three different uh, uh, lobbies at the base of the building, one for the hotel, one for the office folks, and one for the residential folks. And that's on each of the, one for each of the three sides of the building. So you go into your lobby, and then you'd go directly into the central triangular core there, and you get into your elevator, and you you basically go up to your floor uh, and uh, without really any transfers, and then you uh, and exit the elevator and go down a long corridor, uh, along which are located my walls, of course, and then you turn left or right into e either your office space or your residential unit. It's as simple as that. It's almost like a double-loaded hotel uh, that you would see, you know, many many places all over the world. And then one of the most important things that was done on the tower is that the fire escape, the egress stairs, were located at the ends of the three wings. And that was a hugely important maneuver architecturally that we pushed for structurally in that we were able to locate walls around those stairs at the most extreme edges of the building. And those of you who design tall buildings know that that's the best way to get the best bang for your buck is to get structure at outside away from the center of the tower uh, for added stiffness and added strength and resistance to overturning due to lateral wind and, and seismic loads. So it's, it's, that's how the architecture work. In a little bit more detail, you get an idea of how the residential uh, units sort of lay out. And if you have a good architect like we, we did and do uh, on uh, Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill, they basically worked around the wall segments that we needed uh, and you can see how the bedrooms and the, the kitchens and so forth lay out. They use the walls. You can, you can, you know, obviously you can put uh, television sets against them. You can put uh, artwork and they, they work out very, very nicely in terms of the interiors layout. So they're not, they're, in some ways they're much easier to deal with than, than individual round or square columns in residential to have these wall segments. And, uh, and so it actually jived pretty well. Uh, with how we how we ended up with the structure. 
Now, the, the walls that, uh, that I showed you in the previous slide, there's a bit of a hierarchy to them, and, and each one of them has a little bit of a different uh, purpose and usage. Uh, starting with the, the center of the tower, uh, the triangular core uh, is very, very important for its torsional stiffness. Uh, that it, it basically continues from the bottom of the tower all the way up to two-thirds of the height of the building as a triangular core, very vertical, just as you see it. There are far, uh, there are very few openings through the that triangular core because all the openings uh, from the elevator uh, cabs are inward to the center of the triangle. None of them basically exit out through the walls. So it's a solid triangular wall, except at the three vertexes where we had a, a deep coupling game. Uh, for reference, the thickness of the uh, triangular core wall is only 800 millimeters at the base, which is not, not that thick when you think about it for one kilometer tall building. Uh, the walls that run along the, the corridor uh, and then end up being connected to the uh, fire stair walls, those are actually very highly stressed. And those are the ones that have coupling beams. They're 1.6 meters deep at each story. So you have a four meter story and 1.6. You got 2.4 meters below the coupling beam. And on those, we spent a lot of time organizing the openings for the coupling beams. They, we, the, the architects didn't have carte blanche to, to just put the openings wherever they wanted. They had to align uh, because the, we wanted the, the load, particularly the gravity loads, but also the, the lateral overturning loads to flow uh, very nicely and not be moving around in the system. So we did a lot of coordination of openings through the corridor and the fire stair walls. Those walls are uh, 1.0 or one meter thick, 39 inches for US folks at the base. Then the, the cross walls, we call them uh, transverse fin walls. Uh, I would call those to be more stabilizers. They're also uh, fairly highly stressed. Uh, they, uh, they themselves don't have any openings, but they're connected with uh, three span coupling beams uh, to their neighbor on the other side of the floor plate. So the, the beams that you say, see they're connected to the ends of the fin walls, they're continuous across the corridor. So that, that creates a lot of stiffness uh, for those walls, connecting them to the corridor walls through the coupling beams. The fin walls, they're 1.2 meters thick at the base. And then finally, I mentioned the importance of the, the walls that we put around the stairs because they're, they are uh, providing a lot of stiffness for the tower and a lot of strength. And furthermore, they don't have to have any openings in them ever, really at all uh, because you, know, you don't need openings in the fire stair, of course, looking outward. And we, we extended them slightly beyond the dimension of the fire stair to give us even more stiffness out there. And um, they uh, basically the walls drop off as as those uh, uh, as they uh, go up, and they're uh, a little bit thicker than that. Now, um, you know the t the tower is going to be not only the uh, the largest and the tallest tower in the world, but one of the most slender uh, super tall towers. It, we call that the aspect ratio is the height to width ratio. And um, for Jetta Tower, it's 12.1. And how we measure that, because it's three-legged after all, it's basically the distance at the base between the tip of one wing and the perpendicular bisector of the other two wings. So it's kind of a rough approximation of aspect ratio. But the top third of the tower is un unoccupied. The building tapers to the point where there's not really enough room at the top of the tower and really no program uh, from the developer to have any units up in the spire. So what happens is those end walls at the end of the corridors come closer and closer to each other. Finally, they are within the, the triangle in the middle and then they become, they basically form the walls of the spire. So it's, it's a con continuous system but, but the system ends up sort of collapsing upon itself and become basically a concrete silo for the top third of the building. There's no, there's no uh, transfer or anything. It's, a, it's the same system, but it's just uh, a continuation and a reconfiguration with a usage change at the top of the tower. All concrete, by the way, within 
uh, only at the top uh, 50 meters of the tower, there's a, there's a steel spire. Everything else is reinforced concrete. Now again, picking up on this theme of constructability and ease of building, uh, we wanted to control the geometry to make it simple to understand and relatively easy to build. So basically the three wings are, uh, the length of them uh, is the same at the base of the tower. So at the top of the foundation, they, the three wings are the same length. And then they basically rise at an incline that's a constant angle. But the three uh, wings have uh, different angles. So wing A, there's one angle from the base of the tower all the way to its termination point at the top that it rises. And then wing B is slightly different and wing C is slightly different, but they all are planar. There's no kink in the system or kink in, in the inclination whatsoever. And the, and the angles are very, very slightly different. And so what that happens, since the angles are different and they start at the same dimension at the base, of course, they reach the top of the tower at different elevations. And that, that's what provides the sort of distinctive top of the building that you see in the architectural renderings. And, um, and you see a little bit of shaping that goes on at the top of the buildings. But again, those angles are one angle, uniform taper and a, a slope uh, uh, at a constant angle from, from bottom to top. This is a little bit of a view of what happens uh, when we get up to the point where the so-called concrete silo or the spire starts. The three, the three walls, you can see two of them there. They basically continue up into the, the spire, the same angle, it's the same wall that continues all the way up. And then the architects basically close the, the silo. And there's a, there's a one four meter thick piece of, we call it sky raft, that, that sits on. So those are extra walls that are added uh, at the, at the uh, two thirds point along the height of the tower. But those walls themselves have the ability to span too. So uh, it's a fairly s a simple system, but it's all walls. There's very few coupling beams in the, in the spire itself. In terms of materials, uh, I mentioned it's basically an all concrete building. The concrete strength at the, at the base of the tower is 85 megapascal concrete. It's about 12,500 uh, PSI. It's all uh, self-consolidating concrete. Uh, the piles and raft foundation are 60 megapascal. We did use some high strength reinforcing bar at the base, 75 KSI rebar, which is really no premium at all in terms of cost. But generally speaking, when you think about it, there's nothing exotic about the materials. In fact, I would have, I really pushed very hard to use 100 megapascal concrete, not so much because I needed the concrete strength. I just, I, I know that we could have reduced the amount of reinforcement, vertical reinforcement in the walls at the bottom of the tower if we could have uh, used 100 megapascal concrete. I'll show you here in a minute that it turns out that even though we specified 85, we got well in excess of 100 anyway. But, uh, but again, nothing exotic in terms of the material. These are, uh, in this day and age, 12,000 PSI concrete is, uh, is not in, uh, unusual uh, whatsoever for, for a tall or super tall tower. Um, now, in terms of uh, the mix design, it's, uh, these, are, these are fairly uh, normal mixed designs. This is just one of them, actually. Uh, we, we did specify modular elasticity. I'll get into that. That's very important for these tall and super tall towers. You can't forget about stiffness. It needs to be tested for. But it's, you know, it has uh, Portland cement, uh, fly ash. Uh, uh, it's got um, all the uh, mixes that you need. All of the uh, aggregates are local limestone aggregates from uh, nearby quarries in the, uh, near the two holy cities, incidentally. Uh, but it's a, it's a uh, uh, SCC or self-consolidating concrete mix or near SCC. Uh, one thing to note at the bottom here is the density. These high strength concretes are uh, easily sometimes 156 pounds per cubic foot, 158. Uh, that's without rebar. And if you start, if they're heavily reinforced elements, your density of your concrete can be well in excess of 160. So when you use your ETABS models and so forth, and you get a 
standard 150 or 145 for concrete, um, then you'll know that uh, you're probably underestimating for these uh, tall buildings. Here's some of the, the uh, strength that I was talking about just a minute ago uh, for the 85 megapascal concrete. You can see we tested 7, 28, 56, 90, and 100 days. You know, we were reaching well over 100 at 60 days uh, or 56 days. Uh, in fact, even at 28 days, we were, we were beyond 85. And by the time we got to 180, we were probably at 110 or 115 megapascal concrete. This is for 85. So you can see that things are very conservative in the kingdom and they were not going to have low strength concrete whatsoever. It's a shame, unfortunately, because like I say, we could have reduced a lot of reinforcement very easily as the mixed design was, in my opinion, uh, 85 megapascal in name only, really. Now, in terms of uh, design uh, conditions, uh, in terms of first, in terms of seismicity, uh, it's I would call the seismic as uh, low moderate. There is seismic activity uh, in the middle of a fault in the middle of um, the Red Sea, and basically the entire uh, Arabian Peninsula is um, is uh, ringed by a, a, a fault. You see most of the activity though in that top right figure is up near uh, Iran, as you know, and, uh, and of course, Turkey, and some up near Sinai. So we, we certainly had to design for it and had to do uh, site-specific hazard analysis, as you might imagine. But generally speaking, the design for seismic uh, did not govern the design uh, whatsoever. One, one interesting thing is that the pattern of faults there, the Arabian Peak Peninsula is ever so s slowly moving toward Iran, and I told that told that to our client in, in one of our earlier design meetings and he, he kind of raised his eyebrow at me and, and sort of smiled and I, I sort of smiled back and, and left it at that. But uh, that's, the, that's the truth of the matter. Now, in terms of the, the design though, as you, I'm sure you know by now, the, the design is usually governed for the super and ultra tall towers by wind load considerations. So how do you start? We, we normally uh, start looking at benchmarking in terms of the wind climate. So we like to look at the basic wind speed and we work with uh, the, the, the wind tunnel laboratory, usually RWDI, uh, very near you in Toronto, out, out in Guelph. And there are, there are trusted partners for these very tall towers for sure. And uh, we start saying, you know, what, what's the basic wind speed and then what's the code wind speed? So. RWDI has all the climate analysis from a lot of these places, but they, they also dug into what the code is. And you can see for Jeddah, the true climate uh, is about 35 meters per second. So this is a 10 meters, three second gust, 10 meters in height uh, for a 50 year return period. But the code uh, mandated about 42 meters per second. So that's a huge difference. Uh, uh, Dubai, a little bit higher. Uh, uh, and uh, but I would call it very similar to Chicago, probably similar to Toronto, honestly, in terms of wind climate. Surely, nothing like uh, Hong Kong or Miami or other other places in the world that are hurricane or typhoon uh, prone. So not not bad for wind, you know, but not not uh, not super light either. Uh, in terms of testing, we uh, we do uh, as you might imagine. We did very very many tests, and we start we start simple, then get more and more complicated as we go along. So we started with a one to eight hundred scale uh, high frequency force balance, which is basically a rigid model. All of the uh, all the measurement is done at the base, um, and that was a fairly crude model, but it gave us a, a very good idea of the performance of the building very early on. And then we moved in more complicated models. The, the high frequency pressure integration model uh, is uh, also a rigid model, but everything is measured by pressure taps that are located over the entire surface of the model. That was at one to 600 scale. And then what happened was because there's taps and there's wires that run through the middle of the model, 
uh, the, 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 the top of the building was so slender they couldn't get enough taps in there. So we ended up doing a half model for the upper half of the building and that was the Spire only model. Uh, so they could get enough wires and taps for the top. That was at one to 400 scale. They were able to analytically, of course, join the two models for the total results. And then finally is the aeroelastic model. That's the only model that has, uh, it has the feedback effects from the movement of the tower itself. So it's not a, it's not a rigid model. It actually has the stiffness properties built into the model. Very complicated and very expensive. That was at one to 600 uh, scale. Uh, and then one more thing we did. <laughs> we did, uh, we did a, a companion peer review test uh, in another laboratory, also not far from Toronto, at the Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel Laboratory at the University of West, Western Ontario. And basically, what I what we did is I I told them, okay, here you know here's the here's the, the surface model in terms of the geometry. Uh, we want you to use a do a pressure integration uh, test and. Um, you know, here, you know, here's all the other inputs that you need in terms of the structural inputs that's needed to conduct the test. And finally, don't talk to each other in terms of the two wind tunnels. And they did, and we got the results. And uh, by and large, the results after a little bit of discussion were very similar. So that gave us, that gave us good uh, confidence that there wasn't a modeling error or something like that in the wind tunnel testing. And we do that on on some of the, the taller buildings, but it's a pretty rare because it's expensive and time consuming to these do these types of, I would call them a peer review wind tunnel test. And then one other thing came into play. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine on something like this, there's always something going on, but it turns out that the, um, when you, you go to, back to your textbooks and look at the wind speed versus height, it's basically a power law over the height and that's, that's true uh, generally for the uh, atmospheric boundary layer, which is the part of the Earth's surface that the winds are turbulent. And, uh, and the, the surface itself uh, highly depends upon the wind speed. It, just, it really determines what goes on. And that the, really the, the, the uh, uh, profile of the wind speed versus height above about 600 meters is a little bit unknown. So, of course, other than Burj Khalifa, which there was a little bit of work done on this phenomenon, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of information because there's not too many buildings of that height. And the ones that are, there's very little of the structure that's beyond 600 meters anyway. But we had a significant amount of structure above 600 millimeters, 400 meters worth. So the question is, what happens to the profile? Does it take off? Does it kind of do more or less the same what it did before, or does it kind of go almost vertically? Uh, so what we did, and it's mostly RWDI's work, but we, we were a very, very interested uh, bystander, let's put it that way. So they did three things, actually. They, they looked a little bit closer at the uh, surface winds, particularly the influence of the surface winds on the, uh, the data they were getting from the International Airport in Jeddah, because as you can imagine, those are a 10 meter height, generally speaking. And the influence of the buildings around those meters can have a significant influence on, on the data. On most international airports, there's, there are uh, balloon uh, data from uh, balloon launches that they have anemometers and so forth. But as you might imagine, a lot of the data is such that when there's a very big storm, they don't send the balloons out because they're, uh, they're very expensive and uh, there's so they and it's it's not so easy to get the data out of those and of course it doesn't happen very often but what uh what can be done in addition to those two things is a weather research forecasting model which is basically uh, if you don't know it or not but the the, the mega trends uh climate trends and wind trends uh, throughout the world are actually in a database from about 1970 onward these aren't the little uh, local wind speeds that you measure at airports, but these are the type of trends that you see on your weather report on your nightly news uh, at six o'clock in the evening. And those are in a database. So basically what you can do is you can take the topography of your particular location and you can actually go backward and measure what might happen in the future. 
So that's the so-called WERF or weather research forecasting model. So those all three things were put together. And what we did, we didn't design for all this uh, business with the wind speed. We just wanted to make sure that what we were doing was conservative. So you see the building code there all the way uh, at uh, over 42 meters per second and then the, the, the wind speed at height. Uh, and then, and then the, the balloon data would it actually say much lower than that. And the WERF, WERF data would almost say like, once you get beyond four or 500 meters in height, the actual wind speed variation with height is very little, which is an interesting fact. So that gives us some comfort. We, don't, we can't use it in our calculations, of course, but as engineers, that's the kind of result we like to have for some of these uh, interesting studies as we go along during design. In terms of the performance of the building, uh, the motion perception by the occupants is the critical, one of the critical things that we have to be careful about. And this is uh, sometimes a tough one for people to understand, to read it, but basically the performance is the line, the predicted performance from the wind tunnel results. The criteria are the bars and that triangle. So let's focus on that little triangle here for just a minute. That's the ISO 10137 limit for uh, accelerations at the highest occupied floor. In this case, it's 650 more meters in height, uh, nearly 2,000 meters in the air. ISO would tell you that the maximum uh, acceleration at, uh, at 10 years would be about 12 millijis. Our prediction are those, uh, basically the, the blue and the the brown bar are somewhere between four and six millijis, so we're half of the criteria. That, I can tell you for anyone who's designed super tall buildings, that's an astounding number. And uh, there's some reasons for that. I don't, have, I don't think I have too much, enough time to talk too much about it, but the fact that the building is concrete and the fact that the building is tapered are two of the biggest reasons that the performance of the building, predicted performance of the building under wind loads and motion for the occupants will be excellent and, uh, and, um, and uh, much lower. I mean, for, in my experience, you could have a 50 or 60 story building with, with even higher acceleration predictions and there have been some than what you see in this particular uh, graph for the predictions for Jetta Tower. Everyone wants to uh, talk about an analytical horsepower. What, uh, we use practically every platform there is, and, and since we were in the design, we probably could add two more here in 2020. But we, uh, what I like to do, I, I like to use a, a lot of the different platforms, but more importantly, what I do is when I go from one phase, let's say from schematic design to design development, I basically create a whole new model, and probably more importantly, I uh, do it with another different engineer. That's not because I didn't trust the previous model and the previous engineer, but sometimes things are in the model that you, you can't find, you know, and uh, modeling is not black and white. So boundary conditions and stiffness modifiers and the whole gamut of analytical assumptions that are made, they need to be checked. So as you go from one phase to the next and you have the resources on a project of this magnitude, you create a whole new model. And you, and you check to see if the results are in line with the previous model before you continue on with the studies that are required for that particular phase. So we use the CSI platform just like everybody else. We use Midas Gen for vertical shortening. Uh, we use Strand and Abacus for some fairly uh, detailed uh, stability analysis on the tower. Uh, in terms of the fundamental uh, behavior of the building, uh, the first mode is about uh, it's basically a single, single curvature, about 12 second period. Again, uh, when you think about one, one kilometer tall tower, uh, there are buildings that are uh, less than half the height of this building that have 12 second periods. So, and this is a very heavy building, uh, you know, it's not light. So that testifies to me to the very high stiffness of the building to have something this tall with only a 12 second uh, period. Second mode is just another direction, about 11 seconds. And the third mode is torsion, about 5.8 seconds. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the foundations of the tower. Uh, basically, the site is underlain by, uh, it's, there's no bedrock, really. Uh, it's underlain by uh, uh, 
limestone. It's basically uh, the coral limestone. There are a couple of very annoying siltstone and gravel layers that cause some heartache for the piling. And then, unlike most places where uh, the ground conditions get better and better as you go down, actually the, the, the ground's a little bit weaker down below. So basically the solution on all these types of uh, materials, which are not too uncommon throughout the Middle East, is very long uh, straight shaft board piles that take the load of the tower directly into the ground, pretty much through friction along the, the pile shafts. So for the tower, we have uh, 270 board piles. They're in a matrix. Uh, they're generally 1.5 meters, but the ends of the wings are 1.8 meter in diameter. Uh, the links vary from 105 meters in length in the middle of the tower uh, to 45 meters at the edges. Uh, and it's, uh, all of them are connected by a, a raft slab or mat slab that you would call it here in the North America. And that slab is uh, five meters thick at the edges on the edge of, uh, ends of the wing and four five, five meters everywhere else. So it's, it's a piled raft foundation. Some of the load goes directly into the ground uh, right underneath the raft foundation because the materials under there are still, it's not, it's not bedrock, but it's, it's very solid, competent rock. Uh, so a lot of the load goes directly in there into the ground at the top. Now, you might be looking at this slide saying, oh, I get it, there's more load in the center of the tower. That's why the piles are longer there in the center. Uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, actually, the, the, most of the load gets channeled out to the outside, and that's because we, we consciously did that. We actually managed the gravity loads to get out to the edge, and of course, there's a good reason to do that, and that's because you're resisting the wind loads out at the edges of the building, and the, and the, the wind loads are, are uh, higher out there than they are in the middle. But what happens is if you don't have a very stiff foundation uh, for this type of a bearing wall superstructure, uh, you can have uh, the dishing can start to affect not so much the piles, the strength of the piles, or even the, uh, the behavior of the piles, but it'll start be, uh, affecting the superstructure, particularly at the base of the tower. So that's the reason why the towers are longer in the middle. It's to stiffen the dishing effect of the, the enormous weight of the tower on the entire uh, foundation system and, and of course the sub, substructure that's in the subgrade that's surrounding all the board piles. So I'll let you think about that. I know it's late in the evening, but and it's not such an easy thing to grasp, but that's, that's, the, that's what's going on here. We, uh, we estimate uh, about 110 mm of uh, settlement, uh, basically at the end of construction, which will be basically everything in place. There won't be uh, any drastic increase or anything after that. What will happen though, uh, the whole tower is surrounded by a podium and we've been trying to convince uh, the contractor to hold off on that because as the building tower gets built, it will draw down all of the soils and the sub subgrade around the tower. And that's what you're seeing in this plot here. So uh, it's not like just the tower goes straight down, everything else doesn't. It draws down everything with it. But about 104 and a half inches is what we're, we're expecting. Here's just a, a plot in terms of showing the, the fact that the, the seismic uh, base shear and overturning cumulative here is, is in green and the X and Y direction winds are in red and blue. And you can see that the, uh, the wind loads governed by at least 50%. These are all factored overturning moments and uh, story shares. There's a lot of coupling beams in the, in the, in the tower, over 6,000 6, of them. Uh, so we had to have a, a good way of optimizing them. Most of them are, are single span, but as I mentioned before, the, the ones across the corridor are three span. Uh, the typical depths are anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500, but most of them are, are either 1,500 or or 1,600 millimeters in depth. So we designed them all by strut and tie, which at the time uh, was a little bit unusual, that, uh, 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 but uh, it was a lot easier for us to do it that way. And I think it's a, probably a better approach. Most of them were one panel model, strut and tie, but some of them, based on their geometry and the length, uh, had, a little bit longer had to be uh, uh, two panel. Uh, and then of course, 
as in most uh, tall buildings and su super tall buildings, of course, uh, these are very heavily reinforced elements. There's no getting around it. They, they are. And some places we have to use uh, steel plates and as the, if the shear stresses are too high and we can't, uh, can't get around it, we have to add steel plates into the design. And for that, we, we continue to go back to uh, Maddock and Matlock and, and Gaffar paper from 1982 because we think it kind of gives the behavior a little bit better that you get this sort of stress increase right at the edge of the, the wall intersection and then a, a counter, counteracting one at the back of the embed. So we do, we do sort of planar finite element analysis of those. But then once we get those analysis, we don't do that for every single beam, of course. We have, we have to standardize our approach to all the uh, embedded steel coupling beams. Uh, now, we, I mentioned the MIDAS program before, and this has been a huge uh, uh, improvement on what we can do as structural engineers for the analysis. We basically can now build the, the entire building in a program like MIDAS. Uh, yeah, SAP and ETABs are coming along, but they are not as advanced as MIDAS in my opinion. This is a Korean, Korean program, but basically it's a stage construction model. So it's not a spreadsheet at all. You're actually in the, in the model, you're actually building the, the building uh, as, as if it's being constructed. And uh, so it's a fully three-dimensional model. All those structural pieces are in the model, unlike a, a spreadsheet that just does sort of manual calculations. And we take a very close look at the modulus elasticity. And this is where the testing for MOE is very, very important for these tall buildings. Uh, I was involved in probably one of the first projects that, that uh, pushed MOE testing uh, very heavily, which was the Trump Tower uh, here in Chicago. But this gives you a little bit of an idea. For these high strength concretes, a lot of times the, the modulus is going to get to where it's going to be pretty early. I would say you can almost see here at about 56 days, it's kind of it's not going to get much higher than that, you know. So all the way out, we've, we've got test data actually out to two years on some of the MOE uh, uh, cylinders uh, that are being tested. And so the construction, basically what we want to do to ease construction and get it moving is to get the walls moving as quickly as possible and get the slabs in later. And that's exactly what we do uh, through uh, keyways and, and couplers. But we got to get the walls going. We're going to get the foundations done and get the walls moving. We're going to follow later uh, with the slabs. Now, that this, uh, what the Midas program does is you can input all the material properties you want. You can input the construction schedule, of course. And what you get is you can look at basically any behavioral and strength related topic you want to. For example, you can look at the amount of uh, shear in a coupling beam over time, for example, and how much of it is due to gravity and how much of it is due to uh, uh, creep and shrinkage and long-term effects and what happens after 30 years and 100 years. So any place you can probe. And uh, so that's the advantage of having the entire uh, building in a three-dimensional construction phase model like MIDAS. You wouldn't be able to do something like that on the scale we're talking about with so many elements with just a spreadsheet. It's really almost impossible, particularly for a building like this that is coupled so much. You know, if you had just a, a, a concrete core, a rectangular square core that's, you know, basically shortening under its self weight, that's one thing. But this, the coupling beams are moving a, a little bit of gravity load around throughout the entire height of the tower. So, for example, this is basically a plot of predicted amount of force due to dead load, live load, creep, shrinkage, and total over time in a piece of the end wall. Very important topic. Does it get higher or, or does it get lower? Once again, you would have, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, you'd be, you'd be scratching your head a little bit about this one. So it's a really, it's a wonderful thing that is more and more common now and probably in five or 10 years, every uh, legitimate structural engineer will be able to do that. But in my career, 20 years ago, you were using spreadsheets to do this type of thing. Now, I, I, that one has to do with basically the forces in a wall, for example. This is a, a horizontal movement. So you can see, for example, the building is slightly asymmetric, as I mentioned before. Not much, but it's a little bit. So any asymmetric 
tower will work will move laterally under its own self rate as a matter of really as a matter of definition. Uh, so what this can do is not only can you predict it, but you can actually add compensation into the Midas program. So this is a diagram, for example, of horizontal movement at the end of construction. This is at the center of the tower, for example. And, and then what happens if we didn't do anything at all? And what if we, uh, and what if we just had the static solution, which is basically not using time dependent construction phase model at all. It's basically turning on your, your ETABS model, putting the gravity load on and, and having a look at it. So all of these things we presented to the contractor to start to understand some of the construction methodologies and strategies and uh, potential uh, compensations during the construction phase. And then of course, we can always uh, take a look during construction and monitor and see how we're doing over time. So this is one of our construction drawings and it gives all of the information to the contractor about the basic behavior of the tower, our recommendations for compensation. We were not really uh, tilting any of the floor slabs that you normally would see in a super tall building. If you have a, as I mentioned before, as you have a core and an outside, uh, they would generally uh, move vertically very different because they're unconnected. Our inside and outside, if that's what you want to call it, are all connected. So we had very little differential shortening between the ends of the wings and the center of the tower because the coupling beams connected. That's a huge uh, ease of construction for a contractor and something very important for there to understand. So we, we showed how we did it, what was our construction phase assumptions, which we actually got from the contractor, so we read it back to them. And then we also had monitoring locations. So a series of drawings that, that showed our recommendations for how to control the vertical uh, shortening effects and, hor and horizontal movement for the effects under, under the concrete structure uh, over the life of the construction and beyond. Uh, we got, uh, we're getting material uh, data back in Chicago uh, from labs. Uh, a lot of the creep and shrinkage testing was done at CTL labs outside of uh, uh, Chicago here, believe it or not. They ship, they ship the constituent materials for the mix design, the, of course, aggregate, all the admixtures, um, and all the uh, supplementary uh, cementitious materials to uh, Skokie <laughs> and did the, did the testing. The creep frames are still being loaded there, so they're still actually being tested. So we have to take some of that test data and make sense of it and try to. Uh, uh, correlate it to some of the strength and MOE data that we're getting from, from Saudi Arabia as well. So there's a lot of work that's done back in Chicago during the construction phase. It's a, we're involved uh, very, very much so uh, throughout construction back in the United States. Just a few construction photos here. Uh, here's uh, groundbreaking where you can see there's plenty of laydown space for the tower that's, that's in the middle of, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. That, uh, that uh, pole that you see there, that's, that's the geometric center of the tower. I'm just to the, uh, uh, to the right side there. I'm the one in the blue shirt. Uh, our, our, uh, two of our client representatives uh, to my right there. And then to the left, there are three architects. They're all, they're all dressed almost identically, except for the color of their tie. But, uh, but that was a happy day, to, to say the least. That was groundbreaking. Uh, this is some of the pictures from the piling. These are very long cages. 105 meters is very long, so, so it's a fairly slender. This isn't 105. There's only a piece of it. It has to be spliced, of course. All the splices for the, for the rebar and the piles were by mechanical couplers. In fact, all the rebar in the tower walls was done by mechanical couplers. Uh, it's, again, it's a way of reducing some of the rebar congestion in the wall, but you can see the cage gets very slender. and um, all the piles were are constructed under uh, under slurry, so they're they're basically uh, slurry piles. And uh, but they have to use these skids a lot of times to keep them in line while they're picking them up and placing them before they place them down in the hole. This is one wing where all the piling has been completed. You can see that uh, there's no real need for basements because we have so much room for both the, for not only the tower but everything around the tower. So there's just a very small excavation and only a, few, only a meter or two uh, and then you're basically you're basically on uh, competent rock 
Uh, so you can kind of see there that was that was the uh, completion of piling on one wing, and then they basically put a mud mud slab or a blinding slab as you would call, uh, and then they start putting the waterproofing membrane. They trim all the pile heads. Uh, you can see the matrix of piles there, and then we use cathodic protection, uh, which is sort of the Cadillac uh, waterproofing uh, system for the piles. That's connected to all of the rebar for the piles uh, for long-term uh, uh, integrity of the piles and the reinforcing, and also the bottom reinforcement layers in the mat foundation itself. So that's uh, it's a, a fairly expensive but very important part of the, the waterproofing uh, system uh, for the tower foundation. And then, of course, you start getting the reinforcements for the raft. On the picture on the left, you begin to see this fella that uh, he's literally up to his knees uh, in the rebar there. Uh, the rebar will get higher than what it is in that picture to the left. It gets almost to the top of the, the uh, pile bars that you're sticking, sticking up through there. But you can see that that's starting to go in. This is just the bottom layer. You can see it there. One of the things that people don't realize, you know, the, the piles are circular and their rebar pattern is circular, of course. And that can cause a problem for the raft reinforcement if you're not careful because uh, those two patterns don't work that well together. You can kind of see here what we did and what you should always do, honestly, is to have a template. And so that all the bars for the piling are aligned uh, so that you can run the uh, raft reinforcement bottom bars through them. And that's an issue with two different contractors. You know, the guy that's laying the raft reinforcement is not the guy doing the piling. So you have to make sure that they can, they leave a pile head with bars sticking out of it that you can put a uh, raft reinforcement. You see the couplers there on the left. And then when you get to the top, we put a uh, shear reinforcement with, with dead head anchors. But again, between the couplers, and the dead end anchors, uh, these are uh, two big improvements in reinforcing, in my opinion, for some of these heavy reinforcement uh, placements. This is what the, the formwork uh, looks like in place for a five meter thick uh, concrete pour. It's a significant uh, enterprise to take the hydraulic pressures of five meters. So this was the, this was the first, uh, first wrap foundation pour ready, ready for concreting. We did a test queue uh, before we test, uh, we did the concrete 4.5 meter on a side. It's still there on site. Uh, again, this is a self-consolidated concrete mixture, 60 MPA. And there you see there are very little, uh, very light on the Portland cement. I would say it's probably at least almost 50%, uh, nearly 50% replacement of Portland cement with, with uh, other cementitious materials in there. And, um, so what we did is we instrumented the cube uh, for strength and modulus, but most importantly for temperature. So we had long-term uh, uh, temperature uh, readings to make sure the heat of hydration was under control, and we were had a uh, you know a good possibility that the raft would be okay as well. So we had readings coming from the cube, and and, and then the ones from the raft were very similar uh, in terms of what we had we had gotten from the cube. So this is what concrete like that looks like. Again, these placing booms, uh, you, know, they, you know, they drive up there, they can place the concrete wherever they want to. And of course you don't need the vibrators with self-consolidating concrete. So I, I tell people this, it kind of looks like the war of the worlds, but this is, this is the present and future of, of concrete. You can, it's really, really remarkable. And on tall buildings, the same types of placing booms are on, at the ends of, of uh, the, pump lines for high strength concrete. And again, they can place the concrete in the wall without having to resort to buckets and other, other types of sort of old fashioned ways of delivering concrete in place. But you can see, again, this isn't the, the only large pour around the world, but this is a, a day and a half episode. The raft was poured in, in four separate uh, sections, the three wings uh, first, and then the middle was the last one that they did. What happens when they, when they finish the pour, they immediately try to get, uh, get on the slabs and, and put insulation around it. That's to keep the heat in actually. It keeps the differential down between the extremities of the slab and the inside. So that's what you're seeing there with that blue. It's, that's basically rigid insulation that's placed on both the sides 
and the top of the raft bore, you begin to see some of the wall reinforcement at the end wall uh, going up there. And you see preparations for concrete on one wing and another wing already completed there as well. This picture shows the first walls extending up. It was a wonderful day uh, when we saw those back in Chicago. And again, uh, the, the middle of the, the tower, those, those are very deep elevator pits. So there's actually a, a smaller raft, a, a thicker uh, element down below the center there. It's not just a hole in the raft foundation. Uh, you see the jump wall uh, forming system. Uh, again, uh, if you look closely here, there's no slabs. <laughs> uh, they're up uh, probably almost 30 stories in the center of the building with really no slabs whatsoever. And they, and that's the system. The system is very stable. They asked me, uh, Bob, don't you think we should start putting some slabs in? I said, well, eventually you're going to have to put some slab in. So I don't want to, I don't want to underestimate the importance of floor slabs for stability. They are important, but, but the system is very, very stable without having to get the slabs in place and worry too much about them. They were able to take the walls very far up without any slabs whatsoever. Uh, this is our current progress. It's, we're at 260 meters in height. Uh, exterior wall installation has commenced. You can see it down there at the bottom. The first uh, cross wall has dropped off. You can kind of see it there in the picture. Even though we're only at 260 meters in height, 45% of the concrete has been placed. That's a pretty amazing statistic because all of the piling and the, and the raft foundation is a lot of concrete. And of course, the building tapers. And of course, uh, the walls are thickest at the base. So 45% of the concrete is already in place. Uh, we've had a couple of setbacks, uh, mostly having nothing to do with uh, the contractor or the construction. They were, had to do with some of the uh, I would call it political or, or social things that have happened in that part of the world over the last uh, few years. So there has been some stoppage. There's been some uh, fairly, fairly long stoppage, but we're, we're confident and hopeful that th things will recommence again because right now the construction that's going on out there, it's very simple. There's nothing unusual or difficult by the construction right now because they, the, the, the piling and the raft foundation were two of the most difficult ones. And then when they get up to about 600 or 650 meters, they will have to have a secondary pump for the concrete. So they'll pump it up to about 600 meters or so, and then they'll pump up from there. So things will start getting difficult. The wind speeds will get higher and higher as you move up the building and construction. But a lot of the difficulty has already, has already been passed. And so, as engineers, we just want them to keep building, but sometimes things do get in the way, but we're hopeful it'll, it'll recommence uh, here, hopefully even by the end of this year. A couple last things, and then I'll take some questions. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is, you know, when you think about it, these, these tall buildings, uh, there's precious little feedback in terms of analysis assumption compared to something like an airplane where everything is tested at full scale in a laboratory before they ever go in the air for any kind of commercial or uh, flight or production flight. So we take this, this finite element model, of course, and then we do a one to 600 scale a wind tunnel model, which is even close to full scale. And then we build it and we don't really get any feedback in terms of the, how are our assumptions for the analysis? And so as we go into the future, I really believe that the long-term structural health monitoring of these towers is crucial. And it's a, it's, a, it's a thorny issue because a lot of the owners don't really, really want to know. They, they don't want to know bad news, that's for sure. But, uh, but the profession needs to start getting serious about monitoring these buildings. So as engineers, we know if th some of the things that we're doing and wind engineers, are they right? Or, or are they conservative, too conservative, maybe not conservative enough? And so what we did on the tower, we did a whole... Uh, program and of course we can't we can't obligate a client or a contractor to do this but we basically took the entire building all the way from the bottom of the pile piles 105 meters in the ground all the way to the top and told them what kind of uh, monitoring we would like to see what we were trying to measure what kind of uh, uh, monitoring devices you know we think are appropriate you know how often we should be monitoring them not just during construction but over the life of the building 
And so far, they've actually put these devices into the piles, into the raft, uh, into the bottom pieces of walls and so forth. And uh, all of it has to be correlated to environmental loads because having measurements that are not correlated to wind speed, for example, is almost worthless. So we have to have anemometers and we have to be correlated to the wind speeds measured at the airport and on and on. So we're hopeful that uh, these types of buildings will have a feedback that we can actually publish in the public domain so people can make some judgments about the techniques that we use today that are state of the art. Are they, are they the right techniques and are they sufficient techniques to analyze these buildings? Now, one line, before I get to the Q&A, I get one question that I might as well go ahead and answer before I even get it. And that is, uh, uh, how tall can we go? So the picture in the middle there is, is Frank Lloyd Wright's proposal for a, a mile high skyscraper in Chicago. He drew that in 1959, believe it or not. And uh, I guess I would say that um, it's not a question of design. I'm a bit of a skeptic, I must, I have to admit. Uh, you know, one kilometer tall tower is, is, uh, is a challenge enough. But if when somebody says, you know, that, that the engineering, uh, it's, you know, everything's there, just the will to do a mile high tower, I'd say, I'm not so sure that's 100% true. I think you still have to build it. And so I think to build these things, it's going to take different types of construction. Elevatoring is a huge issue. It's got nothing to do with structure, but it, it's a huge issue. It can be a constraint. But the sheer thing most important is uh, who would want to live in it? I mean, even these buildings, you have to realize, you know, the building, it's a beautiful view of the Red Sea, of course. But when you get to some of these heights, you start to ask yourself, is that a very attractive place to live? So is it a practice, practical place to work? Uh, it takes a long time to get to your, your unit or your office. And I just think that there are other things in play other than structure. I can design it. There has been designs for mile high towers. I can assure you of that. So it's not that it cannot be designed to meet code and, and can be done, but not so outrageous. The motions can be controlled by dampers or, or what have you. Question is, is will it, or will there be a, a real need for it? And uh, that's the thing that I don't, I don't foresee, certainly in my, the rest of my lifetime it happening. But uh, uh, that's, that's just my opinion because it comes up quite a bit for, for all of the ones. So with that, I think uh, just the last picture of, of the current construction you can see there and picture on the right is we're a little bit higher than that picture shows, but we're, we're constantly, we kind of superimpose a to tower on its, its ghostly image, which someday hopefully the two will merge. And uh, I want to thank everyone for, for listening. And uh, let's see if I can call up some, some questions here while we have some time. We have no less than 30 questions. <laughs> oh, let's see. Should I start? I guess it's uh, polite to start at the top, huh? Let's see. All right, first question. Were there any special detailing considerations for the link beams connecting the shear walls at the central spine? It appears that the beams and walls are not coplanar. No, they, they, they are. Uh, basically, the, um, at the intersection of the corridors and the triangle, there's a, there's a link beam right there. So it's like a big, I would call it like a big lug, okay? And uh, so we don't have a link beam right at that intersection. It's a piece of wall, uh, but across the corridor, there's a, there's a uh, link beam. So that was actually a very, we had to look at that very carefully in terms of uh, that particular location. All right, second one, what property modifiers were used for coupling beams? Any testing carried out to verify the same? Uh, the, the stiffness modifiers uh, were are fairly standard. Basically what we do is we look at the level of cracking in the, in the coupling beams, and we find that uh, for shear and flexure, for example, the stiffness modifiers around 0 0.5, 
sometimes if they're very, very uh, highly stressed, we have to go uh, lower than that. Um, so those are, those are generally the modifiers that they have on that. Torsion usually is not a big player, but when we, when we do, we usually have a fairly low stiffness modifier for, for torsion in those. Uh, are you confident there are no long-term deflection issues at the slab edge, especially in the central areas, considering no spandrel beams and irregular support? I recall great problems with unexpected excessive slab edge deflections, which required expensive remediation on the Burj Khalifa. Uh, there was uh, some unexpected deflections on Burj Khalifa, but those slabs, uh, we're very similar in terms of um, uh, dimensions. There's nine meters between the wall segments. Uh, it's very similar to Burj Khalifa, but Burj had a slab thickness of 200 millimeters, I think, as a general uh, slab thickness. Plus it had those very long uh, scalloped cantilevered edges. Our, our cantilevered edges uh, typically are, are not very much beyond the walls and our slab thicknesses are 250 millimeters. Uh, now, I lied a little bit about that area near the center, the triangular center. We did have some downstand beams, not on the edge of the slab, but extending out from the walls to kind of stiffen that edge out there. But, but no, no we, we think we're, we're confident, and several of those floors have been built, uh, and we haven't experienced any uh, significant slab deflection issues for the first 260 meters of the tower. Uh, Let's see here. Is there an advantage uh, to having a spire so high compared to no spire? <laughs> well, now you're getting into uh, into questions that uh, are have more to do with the aspirations of the client. And so it's true that the spire is there as a means to reach one one kilometer in height. That was one of the goals for the tower. He wanted to be the world's tallest building, and he wanted to be the first building to reach one kilometer in height. So the spire uh, is, is a means of doing that. So it was, there was never really a question of not reaching uh, um, one kilometer in height. Uh, it was always going to be that way. The only, only thing was how is the architecture gonna do it and how are we gonna structure it? Um. It, was there a huge thrust to be resolved at the base of the angled walls at the foundation level? Uh, not, not huge. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's an inclined leg, but it's not like, you, I mean, the, all the other walls for the corridor are actually there too. So it's, it's not like the Eiffel Tower where you have this, this huge, with nothing, obviously you just got a horizontal component of a very large compression force. You also have the entire uh, system of walls uh, connecting it. So uh, large, everything is large at the base of the tower, no question about it, uh, but not as if you had a, literally a three-legged uh, platform. Uh, were there any fire safety concerns with regards to explosive spalling that comes with the use of high-strength concrete? I think this, this issue has been uh, pretty much resolved in the literature that, uh, you know, with proper proper cover and, and the proper mix designs, there uh, there shouldn't be an issue uh, with that. And uh, we did we did talk to ACI and got their opinion about it, particularly from uh, experts at CTL and so forth. And we're confident that that's not going to be an issue. One of the things that we have on this tower that uh, is perhaps uh, better than other buildings is we have walls so we don't have individual columns so uh, they're 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 more lightly stressed and they're they're continuous so their design to me is more redundant to begin with uh, for those types of issues i don't want to make sure i don't Why wasn't uh, PT used? No, wait a minute, let me go up here. Sorry, I missed, I don't wanna miss. There we go, okay. What is the inspection schedule like on site? 
how often is the concrete mix tested and the reinforcing bar arrangements inspected before the concrete is poured? Do you have any engineers on site? We, uh, we don't have uh, engineers. I've been over there uh, several times myself. Uh, we're working with Dar al Handasa. They're based in, in Cairo and uh, Beirut. And they're our partners to take the project through construction. Uh, the, the testing regime for the concrete is uh, standard. The, the number of cylinders per cubic meter of concrete is pretty much like any other project. It's just you have a lot more concrete, so therefore you have more tests. But we test strength at 28, 56, and 90 days. Our, our basically, our, our acceptance criteria is at 90 days for the high strength concrete for the tower. So we allow the 85 megapascal to be reached at 90, but we've had no problem whatsoever uh, on the strength design, as you can tell. In terms of rebar placement, all of it's, all of it's reviewed by uh, uh, independent inspectors as well as Dara Handasa on site. Um, I'll discuss the questions you've already answered so you can start doing just the top one. I'm sorry? I'll dismiss the questions you've answered so you can just read the top one. Okay. Oh, okay. So go to the top. Yeah. Give me just a second. <laughs> yeah, the slab edge I did. So um, the I, one I, with Andrew, Andrew Fisher is the next one. Okay. For the modulus test, testing of the concrete, did you use plain concrete cylinders or was there rebar uh, cast into the cylinder? Plain concrete cylinders for modulus. For the uh, creep tests, we did uh, some companion cylinder cylinders with rebar in them. Uh, won't higher strength concrete create problems with the capacity design principles for the seismic design? Like I said, this was not, it was not really high seismic uh, design. And again, the concrete that we designed for isn't really extremely high concrete, so it's it's within the provisions of the code. So um, basically, the seismic design was two way, so there wasn't any any issues with the concrete strength in terms of the seismicity. Are the main walls subjected to flexo compression, or does tension appear in any combination? Uh, there's a little bit of tension at the base of the tower under factored loads, but under service loads, no tension at all, believe it or not. So, we, you know, the weight of the concrete is, you pay a penalty for, for the foundations, of course, but it actually, it does a wonderful job in terms of keeping the stresses under control at the base of the tower in terms of overturning. It's one of the things we're, we're very proud. So no, no, real, no real tension on the piles, and even the small tensions we have under under factored loads are, are really quite low, uh, below the mod, uh, modulus of rupture anyway. So all the stiffness modifiers for the walls are basically 1.0. Uh, why wasn't uh, PT used to lighten the dead load? Uh, we, we thought about it, but um, the contractor, Saudi Bin Laden Group, uh, decided they didn't really like the, the idea of using PT. They just wanted to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, they also, uh, uh, we're a little bit worried about uh, some of the issues that were going on in Dubai uh, in terms of slab deflections. So they just, they wanted to be a little bit conservative. So we, we had, a, I think we have a very robust slab thickness of 250 generally. And uh, they thought that would be a better solution. So they were more comfortable with it. Again, I think it's more of an idea of doing things as simply as possible and not complicating the construction. Um, this is a very stiff building. Were there any considerations to reduce stiffness in order to better optimize resources and material consumption? Uh, no, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, it is a stiff building in my opinion, but at the base of the building, it's pretty high reinforcement. Uh, so it's basically strength designed in some ways. Certainly, it certainly is at the base of the tower. Uh, we met all of our drift limits and all of our uh, motion perception limits, but the wall thicknesses really needed to be what they needed to be. I'll also say that the, the coupling beams were, uh, were very heavily reinforced, as I mentioned. So you cannot really very easily reduce the wall thicknesses without uh, impacting the coupling beams. 
So if, you know, you try to choose the, the wall thicknesses that you have and the coupling beams and depths that you, that you need. And I, th I think generally speaking, it's about as efficient as you can get. Uh, was there any issue achieving pile of verticality for 105 meters deep piles? No, we did, we did pile load test uh, to that depth and they, they were able to do, uh, uh, test the uh, verticality with inclinometers and so forth. So, but you know, it, you know, it doesn't have to be, again, you're, you're shedding loads along the entire length of the pile. So it's not, it's not like a, a end bearing pile where you're, you, all the load has to go all the way to the down. You got something 105 meters. So it's, um, it, we, we, we didn't have any uh, major problems with achieving that, although they were long piles and you, and the piling contractors, you know, have to, you have to get reputable piling contractors that have done something like that. Uh, at least something near that, uh, in previously. Um, so diagonal bars were placed at different angles in multiple coupling beams. Wondering about congestion at joints. I'm not sure what that comment means. Uh, not, sh not sure which bars those are referring to. Apologies. Uh, how did your account for the stiffness added by the steel plate in the coupling beam for your shortening? models it doesn't uh the coupling beams aren't hugely important uh we basically uh we basically put the coupling beam as a composite element but most of the shortening has to do with the walls themselves the coupling beams are they're basically moving a little bit of, of vertical load around or what they're doing but it's mostly the walls so you know your assumption for the stiffness on the coupling beams for with the plates and so forth I wouldn't think would have a huge impact on that. Uh, what takes the base shear? Did you have battered piles? No, it basically the, the loads go directly uh, into the raft and into the tops of the piles. So there is no, there's no battered piles and there's no, uh, there's very little of it that really comes out against the, the top of the raft foundation. Some of it comes out there, but most of it just comes at the top of the piles themselves. So you've got the 270 piles, and then geotechnically they can actually look at how the loads get into the ground through the tops of the piles. They they use L pile analysis and that type of that type of study. So it's basically going through the piles, tops of the piles. Were there any supplement supplementary damping systems? Uh, no. No, we don't think uh, we don't. If, as far let, let me let me put it this way: for the uh, for the occupants at the top of the tower, there's no uh, need for damping. What we did do, though, is for the spire itself. Even though there's no occupants up there, we know that there has to be maintenance done up there. They have to they have to get to the outside of the building and maintain the outside. They have to go all the way up into the top of the spire uh, upon occasion to to maintain things and, and uh, inspect and review things up there. So we, based on the wind tunnel results, the movements up at the top of this, the top spire were somewhat high. Even though there's not much of a criteria for that, I thought that it would be important to keep the environment up there for maintenance workers reasonable. So I specified uh, a damper system really for the movements of the spire itself. So. That's, that's what we plan on doing to keep the motions of the spire under control, not the permanent inhabitants of the building. So yeah, there is at the very top in the spire. Were there any horizontal construction joints in the raft? No, no. They were uh, basically in the entire five meter pour was done continuously, no horizontal joints. I'm curious to know about the amount of lateral displacement of the tower under design wind loads. Oh yeah, I are, and also were there any supplemental damping? No, no, uh, no supplemental damping for the occupants. So again, lateral displacements were uh, basically for a 50 uh, year wind load, were about one in one in 600, one in 650. So at the at the top of the spire. So basically within 
normal criteria. A lot of people will go even softer than that, but uh, so that's for a 50 year storm. Thank you, Barbara. If you don't mind, I can read a question for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, sorry if I missed, but can you talk a little bit about the nonlinear analysis you did for the building? Um, well, the, the, the biggest nonlinear analysis that we did was really for the creep and shrinkage. <laughs> to tell you the to tell you the honest truth, we did do, we did do some anal uh, nonlinear uh, for seismic and uh, but it really uh, the wind loads govern everything. The most nonlinear thing about the tower is really the construction and the nonlinearity and the and the concrete materials. Honestly, so that was the most important thing. The next question is: uh, Greetings from Malaysia. Will you provide the, the record webinar? Some of us have difficulty attending due to the time difference. It's much appreciated. Yes, I think yes, we will do. Okay, that's up. That's up to you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next question is: Was there any issue with the torsional velocities at top of the tower? No, the tor torsional velocities are very low for the tower, and. Uh, yeah, the 5.9 seconds and the concrete really uh, helped a lot. The, the torsional velocities were one third of the criteria. It's very stiff torsionally. And again, the, uh, the, uh, and that has to do with the way the system's configured. My next question is, do you have any presentation slides available on your website? Yes, we will do. So next question, were there any, were there any special consideration in architecture to counter vortex shading? Uh, Yes, I think that the uh, the tapering is a huge issue. And uh, since if we have a few minutes here, I can kind of describe the aerodynamics of, of the tower. Basically, the reason there's a there's a good reason why the three-legged form is good aerodynamically. And um, what happens is you got you have two separate possibilities for the wind hitting the tower uh, and potentially causing vortex shedding. For the three-legged tower, you can have a wind that hits basically directly into one, the end of one wing. And what happens there is the building uh, basically acts like a cutwater. So the, the, the wind kind of just speeds off the sides. Uh, and then it, th there's no real uh, uh, backside for it to react against. So it's actually uh, works quite nicely that way. The other possibility is the wind hits directly into the, into the center of the building and it rushes around two wings. And then you don't have vortex shedding because the third wing is so far away. So it's the shape uh, is just very aerodynamically stable. And that combined with the tapering, the tapering is very important for the tower. I think it's quite, quite a bit better actually than the step uh, tower uh, because you can have vortex shedding and aerodynamic issues for pieces and parts of the tower that are that are basically prismatic over over a certain height. So yeah, it, it's basically the three-legged shape and the tapering are the two most important things architecturally, structurally we did to shape the tower. So next question is how does the exterior view platform tie into the structure? Any interesting challenge with the feature, with that feature? Yeah, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time to talk about the viewing tower. Uh, it's a steel viewing tower. It's basically cantilevered off. And it's basically, it's, bit, it's a big outrigger, big steel truss uh, that tapers from the, from the building at, at uh, maximum depth and tapers out. That's a, it's more complicated than that, of course, but it's, a, it's an all steel structure. And uh, it was, it was uh, it's a story that you might be interested in. It was originally a helipad. A view, viewing platform and um, the architects they started talking to helicopter operators and showed them the showed them the tower and the configuration of the pad and so forth and they said they architects said well what do you think and they, they all said the same thing they said absolutely not <laughs> we're, we're not <laughs> that's a horrible idea and the reason why when you think about helipads they're almost always at the top of buildings so there's not really the type of turbulence that can the wind as they rush out toward, uh, you know, past the tower causes for something at mid height like that, and particularly for something this tall. So they said that you'd have way, way too much turbulence for a helipad. So they, at that point, the the owner tried to get rid of rid of the helipad, 
and the architects decided they thought they really liked it and they convinced they convinced the owner to, to keep it in the project as an observation platform so that's that's the long story of, of that one so next question is what was td's budget for this project you mean our our design fee <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I guess he's got asking a construction budget. Too little. <laughs> okay, next question. What what would you suggest using steel for such tall buildings? No, no, not in a million years. Now I think it's just it's it's too light. Uh, it doesn't have enough damping, and it doesn't doesn't have enough. There's not enough self weight. To resist the overturning loads, I'm telling you, as an engineer, it was um, I, I was I, I felt a, a lot better having very little tension at the top at the bottom of the building. I'm old. I'm I've been in the business almost 36 years now, and the steel buildings. Uh, unfortunately, I'm I I have a lot of friends at AISC. Uh, probably have more friends at ACI now than I did uh, before, but you would never have been able to do this tower in steel. In my opinion, it would it would have been it would have been exorbitantly expensive and taken way too long to build. And I don't know how you would have gotten the performance. At some stage, you're going to have have the concrete uh, for for these tall towers. So the next next question is uh, in ETAP's analysis, is shown that a static result of a horizontal displacement. If the time history and dynamic uh, calculated, the result should be close to the stage analysis result. Am I right? Yeah, any times analysis. I guess. Uh, uh, oh, you're saying if you'd use the ETABS uh, nonlinear? ETABS has gotten better uh, uh, in the last few years. Uh, but when we were designing uh, uh, several years ago, my, uh, they, it wasn't. You know, they, the ability to, it's not so much the solver and the time dependent uh, analysis method, it's all the ability to put in uh, custom material curves and so forth that you need for these high strength concretes. And Midas was far more robust on that. And I still, even today, I think it's slightly better, though I, I understand from my engineers now that, that the CSI projects are getting uh, are coming a little bit closer, but in the meantime, Midas uh, is getting better as well too. So I, th I think both of them can be used uh, today. Uh, but when we were designing it, uh, Midas uh, was uh, about the only one that we thought gave us the right uh, ability to predict the, the long-term shortening. So next question is a great presentation. When do you think the construction will be completed bearing any other delays? Well, I think they, they have about, um, I think about uh, three years uh, left to go. Uh, they, they had predicted about, uh, uh, I would say 48 to a little bit more than 48. So it'd be, it'll be about three years. I mean, the, the steel or the, the Structure should top out well before that, but they got a lot of exterior wall to do, and it's just a question of, of uh, like I say, they just have to, they have to get back to it and and uh, and get their production up. The, the system was designed to be built as quickly as it can, can be, but uh, other things have come into play, as I'm sure you've seen on the, on the news reports from that part of the world, and um, and hopefully when it does get started again, it'll get started in earnest. That's our hope to, for them to go very, very quickly. Okay, next question. Was there spatial design consideration outside of the code for an attack against the building? Uh, we did do, uh, it's, uh, fortunately, it's a very uh, redundant system, as you can kind of tell from the system diagrams that we showed. So we did look at, uh, "Quote unquote immaculate removal of, of pieces of wall uh, throughout the tower, and we found a lot of ability for loads to be uh, moved around uh, between uh, the elements if we lost a certain piece of wall, for example. Uh, but basically, the safety of the building, uh, in terms of uh, those kind of un unforeseen type events, is going to be provided by the security. There's a huge standoff." Uh, from the tower and a whole system of, of security for, for uh, 
vehicles and so forth that won't be able to get close to the tower. So that's the number one priority. But we, the system itself, in my mind, is extremely redundant. No question about it. Okay, next question. Could you recommend a book regarding practic practical structural optimization for high-rise buildings? That's an interesting question. Oh, could you recommend uh, optimization? Not a, I don't know if there's been a book uh, on it, but there's been several uh, technical papers uh, that have been written um, over, over the years. I mean, most of the, uh, most of the optimization techniques are, are, um, are energy methods uh, type things. So basically you, you can optimize for, a, uh, let's say a lateral drift and uh, use virtual work. And uh, those, those procedures have been around for a long time and they, they can be brought to bear. We can even optimize for if you have a target period, for example, based on the wind tunnel results. Uh, those things can be done, and and those uh, those formulations are are in the literature. So next question: Have the design of a structure considered any seismic impact? Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, it's 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 basically uh, 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 seismic zone basically two A. So all of the all the Middle East is has uh, seismic uh, requirements. For, for the design. So it's, um, like I say, it's sort of uh, moderate to low seismic design, but yeah, you still have to do all the calculations for the, for the seismic uh, throughout, the, throughout the entire tower, even though it doesn't govern a lot of the, um, or really any of the elements, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's UBC uh, uh, 97 is, is still being used as a standard throughout uh, the Middle East. It was certainly when we were designing, although they're, they're, they're switching over to IBC now, and they're in the middle of switching over. But yeah, that was a seismic design was carried out for the entire uh, tower. Uh, and also we, used, we did a whole uh, 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 site-specific hazard analysis. Uh, uh, Langen, the geotechnical engineers did that for us to benchmark the seismic behavior from all the literature and uh, for all the uh, various areas. Okay, uh, sorry, for, sorry guys for everyone. Um, uh, due to your limit of time, uh, we can only take uh, five more questions. So please understand. So next question is how you manage construction joints and avoid shrinkage crank? Uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about for the floor slabs or or the walls or, or, or what, but um, basically the, the wings and the, uh, uh, the central core actually is, is uh, extended about seven stories above the, the wings. So, uh, and then the wings are slightly offset. So you're not really pouring the entire floor slab in one go. So you're basically uh, pouring basically one wing and, uh, so basically, it's it's a reasonable size pour. It's not not too long of a pour uh, for either the walls or the core. It's basically we're just controlling it uh, by the size of the pour. Is the best way to put it. So next question: What is the advantage of a matas sta stage of construction analysis comparing with ETAPS and SEP two thousand? Well, I think I just uh, mentioned that uh, at the time, the biggest advantage was basically being able to uh, put in the material curves and be able to get the results in the post-processor in the sort of formats that we wanted. And, uh, you, know, they, they, you know, they had all the different uh, uh, analysis techniques, you know, the Bizant and the Carter Lockman procedures were all already coded in there. And uh, and it had some really nice features in terms of being able to to uh, put in a custom curves that we were getting from the test data, and then being able to get the results out uh, fairly reasonably. And uh, like I say, some of the software is getting better. There's no doubt about it. They they started to see papers that we wrote for these towers and our some of our competitors the same thing. And you know everyone's looking at the software to see what gives them the best 
most efficient way of getting the answers out of the machine. And it turns out that Midas was sort of the first ones that were able to do it. Now, now keep in mind, we only used the Midas for the vertical shortening aspects. We didn't use it for, for the uh, basically basic gravity and wind and seismic analysis. That was all done in, in, in ETABs. And other, we did some, we did SAP for uh, some companion models and a few other programs, as I mentioned before. But ETABs was, is still sort of the, uh, the program that's used the most for strength design throughout the, throughout the Middle East. The next question, how many people from TT were involved in this design team? Yeah. Was this a coordinated package with structural yeah. services? It's a good, good question. Uh, it's not as many as you might think. <laughs> we, <laughs> had, we had about, um, people ask that question a lot. We had about, I think we had, the team was about 15 of us at the, at the peak of production during the construction document phase where we were finishing up all the analysis. But you have to realize there's a very large podium at the base of the tower that houses all of the um, ballrooms and all of the support spaces for the, the tower, hotel, and residential occupants. So swimming pools and parking and all kinds of other stuff. So some of the people were working on that. In some ways, there was more manpower uh, working on the podium than there was on the, on the tower shaft itself. So the, uh, it was a pretty small team. And I think I attribute that more to, it's just, there's not that many moving parts. It's all walls and coupling beams and floor slabs. Yes, every, every, every floor is slightly different from a floor slab perspective, but you know, it's just a lot of coupling beam designs and a lot of wall designs and a lot of analysis, obviously, to make sure you're meeting your, your uh, performance targets. Uh, next question, was there is any type of a soil structure interaction analysis done or any prior layout optimization? Yeah, that was, uh, there was. <laughs> and it, it had to do, I didn't have enough time to show it, but it had to do with this issue that I mentioned with the uh, stiffness of the foundation affecting the strength of the walls at the bottom of the tower. And we did do uh, soil structure interaction in a, in, in the way that was done there, now you might put the whole thing in a, in a large model with the two, with the foundation and the structure in one model, but there we had to pass uh, results from the two models between the, the subgrade model done by Langen and our structural analysis model until they converged. And uh, that's one of the uh, reasons why we, we ended up with the longer piles in the center of the tower. That was based almost entirely on the soil structure interaction that we did uh, for the for the foundation element. It was a little bit of a surprise that, and uh, you know, it's easy to say you should have known that all, but you know, some things, you know, you have to analyze and then you have to figure out, figure out why it is. And we have a good reason we think for why the, while, why the piles are so long in the center. And it made sense from the inter interaction studies we did with Langa. The next question, what aspect of the project give you the greatest satisfaction as a structural engineer after completion of design and documents? I, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the most satisfactory or satisfaction I got was really the simplicity of the system. I'm, uh, <laughs> I just, I like to see things that people can understand. And um, I, we kept looking you know, it, it seems so simple when you look at it now, but I can tell you without working with the architects, it would have, you know, we could have had something quite different. And, and putting the walls where they're, they're best for the architecture worked out well with us. There was a lot of back and forth, as you might imagine. Uh, some of the architectural team didn't want those walls at the end of the corridors. Uh, we were able to convince them that we needed them. Uh, but it was the configuration and simplicity of the system, but also the performance of the system. The fact that the accelerations are so low at nearly 2,000 feet in the air that we don't really we don't need a damper for the uh, controlling the accelerations for the occupants. The fact that there's very there's really no tension on the foundations that the weight of the building is such. The fact that it's all concrete and it, it's simple construction. It's walls and slabs. Those are the things that I kind of look look at and say. Uh, I think we, we, we did the job because we, we did something that was, works with the architecture, but can be built. And I think when you, when you talk about these very, very tall buildings, 
that's going to be the key is to come up with something that's not too complicated that a contractor can feel comfortable about building so okay last question thank you bob for your presentation and share your solid experience with us actually not question it's a statement <laughs> thank you thank you very much bob oh, okay yeah my pleasure thanks thanks for taking some time yeah, sorry about that, everyone. And due to the limit of time, we have to end the Q&A session now. For those, uh, if you have not, you know, have any further question, or if you have any question have not been answered, please feel free to touch us. And um, we have recorded tonight's event, um, which will be posted in the iStructure website, so you can review it in a later time, or share with your colleagues and friends afterwards. Um, the last thing is for those who uh, registered tonight's event, you you can't. Contact information will automatically be saved in our regional group contact list. Therefore, you will be receiving the post in the future events. If you don't like to receive this kind of information, please feel free to contact us. We will remove your contact information from our database. Okay, last, for those students with structural engineering discipline who would like to become a stru uh, student member by G and would like to involve in the regional group, feel please feel free to contact us. Okay, Bob. Thank you very, very much once again. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.